Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Unfortunately, I don't speak Spanish at all. So uh, with the you know, French and Spanish having some common roots, I understand a few words, uh, but I'm not really able to speak it at all because I don't learn Spanish at school. So I'm sorry, I'll be speaking in English. Okay, so uh, today we'll be speaking about the latest features in Guru 1.8 and uh, you will also have a, um, you'll, you'll have a look at uh, what we're currently working on for the next major, major version of Groovy. So, well, I've already been introduced. Um, so, I'm Guillaume Lafarge, working on the Groovy project since 2003. So, that's been uh, quite a long time already. And um, I'm also the co-author of Groovy in Action. We'll have a, a new uh, batch of um, beta chapters ready soon. And especially uh, the one I wrote on domain-specific languages, which might be interesting for you if you're uh, into that stuff. Okay, so I'll start with uh, just a few figures uh, about the previous major version. And, well, I, I won't make, make you guess, but um, we had a lot of downloads uh, of Guru 1.7. Um, the first month, the second month after uh, the release, totaling to even just for the first two months, uh, something like 362,000 downloads. So that doesn't mean users, and it's really just downloads of the Groovy distribution. So it's not even counting things like uh, Maven central uh, downloads. So perhaps it's just the tip of the iceberg, but it's some figures to, um, so, so that you have a, an idea of the size of the community uh, on the Groovy project. And I'm not even counting, you know, Grails downloads or Gradle downloads, etc. It's really just pure downloads for uh, the Groovy distribution. So perhaps we have half a million users around there. Uh, if you compare that to the nine million users of Java, the language, that's a, that's a good share of um, the Java developers. So that's uh, an interesting figure that you can keep in mind. So we'll have two sections, uh, the novelties in 1.8 and the things we're working on in Groovy 1.9. So first of all, my favorite feature of Green 1.8, Common Chains, uh, which is a way of removing, so it's very interesting for domain-specific languages, it's a way of removing more punctuation in your uh, method calls, especially in the case where you are chaining method calls. Um, so it's a bit like println hello, where you don't put, you know, parentheses, etc., or semicolons, uh, but extended to chained method calls. So you'll have less dots and less parentheses so that you can write more readable business rules and write uh, DSLs which are closer to plain English, plain Spanish, plain French, etc. So let's have a look at what I mean by that. Turn left then right before in GRI 1.7 and, and before. Uh, this is the kind of stuff uh, that would throw some compilation error uh, because uh, turn left, okay, understand, but then uh, what's that token there? It's not valid syntax for a Groovy 1.7 and before. So the idea is uh, to support that for chain method calls. So the code that you see here is now valid in Groovy 1.8 and it's an alternation of method names and parameters. And if you want to parse that mentally yourself, if you add back the parents and dots, that's uh, the equivalent, uh, exact equivalent of that call. Then a uh, turn which takes left as argument. This call returns some value. Dot, we call a method on the return value of the first call. Then and it takes another parameter, right. Okay? So no parents, no dots. That's the idea to write um, DSLs which look more like plain English, plain sentences. So um, let's see what we used to do before. For example, this is a DSL, um, a, a real world DSL from American researchers studying um, the impact of drugs, uh, anti-malaria drugs uh, on the human body. So they wrote a DSL like that. So take two pills of chloroquine after six hours. That reads just like a plain English sentence. 
But as you can see, um, so we are using normal arguments, two dot pills, and we also use named arguments of colon Horkinian after colon six hours. And this kind of call uh, would call that method down there. So all the named arguments are being put, so this is just a convention, a call convention from Groovy. So you don't have to do anything really special to implement that DSL, apart from following the convention, the call convention. All the named arguments are going to be put in, inside the map and all the non-named arguments are going to be put after the map. So two dot peels would return some drug quantity, medicine quantity, whatever. So this was already nice in GRI 1.7 and before, but perhaps we could do better and have even less punctuation so that it reads more like uh, an English sentence. And with common chains, you can do that. And this is actually a chained method call. So that's not going to call the same method as earlier, but this is going to call uh, a different method. Let's have a look at um, how one can implement that. So often, uh, just to come back on that one uh, before, uh, in Java APIs, you see that pretty often uh, that people are using the fluent API pattern or um, sometimes called the, the builder pattern, where you have uh, methods returning this. So take two pills would return this, the, the current uh, builder object. Uh, you would call off on that builder and this would again return this, etc. So this is a common pattern that you see nowadays in, the, in a lot of APIs, um, the Hibernate Criteria API uh, and man, many APIs. And I'm going to show you another trick, uh, a nice little groovy trick to instead of uh, creating as many methods as um, elements of that chain, uh, how you can actually use maps and closure to create just one method for that kind of calls. So first of all, first of all we'll need some initialization uh, to support the two dot peels and six hours notation. We use expandometer class um, to return um, some value. Here I'm really just returning uh, the, the number itself rather than creating a uh, drug quantity class or instance. Then I have the name of the drug from somewhere, chlorokinin. And then the bit which is interesting is uh, how I'm call, uh, the, the implementation of the take method. So take takes <laughs> uh, one value, which is going to be two dot peels, and take two dot peels will return a map. Um, with just one key off, and which returns a closure. And actually, when you do take two dot pills dot off, it's going to return the, that closure. And then, imagine the, the parents uh, for that uh, variable here. And it's actually a call of the closure which is inside that map. So this is going to call that closure. And again, that closure is returning a new map. That's exactly the same pattern. You, can, you could nest that within uh, each closure, each uh, map. And then it's going to call, uh, so you're going to, to get that map at that point there. Dot after is going to return that closure. And as you're passing a new parameter, six hours will be the, the value uh, passed as parameter to that closure. So that's a way to have just one take method for that kind of sentence. But you could also imagine other keys, etc., if you have some variance for that uh, DSL. So this is a nice little trick that you might use, or you can use the, the Fluent API uh, pattern as well. So it allows you to write sentences like that. But you will notice that there are still some dots. And what about? Uh, removing those dots completely so that you can really write a pure English sentence. Take two pills of chloroquine after six hours. You can do that. And we'll go, we're going to use the same technique, except that um, this part is interesting. That's a, a method call where six is a method call, right? So let's hear how we can implement that. So, with the, the, so that, that's not exactly the same um, chained method calls, uh, because as you can see here, um, here we take a number 
and dot .peel is now a method call, etc. So that's not the same kind of call. And uh, we apply the very same technique. Uh, so we take the number here. Peels now become uh, a method call somehow, which returns a new closure. Off is a silent word. We don't care about the value of that parameter. Chloroquinine, here you would have a map with all the possible uh, drugs that the, the patient can take. After is yet another word that is not really uh, important here. And you can have a map or uh, um, another uh, structure potentially because here six is somehow hard coded but you can create a map, a special map that returns uh, the duration as for, for every hour, not just six. And well, this would return, well, the, the, the meat of uh, your uh, DSL would be obviously implemented here. So here I just implemented an empty shell for that DSL and then you have to fill in the gaps. So this really allows for very readable uh, English-like uh, sentences in your DSL. That's one of my favorite features. Let's have a look quickly um, at some other examples. So in those previous examples, I was just using a single argument, but you can have several arguments. So take coffee with sugar, milk, and liquor. Uh, you can also uh, use named arguments and uh, non-named arguments. Check that, margarita tastes good. Uh, and we'll, I'll add the parents and dots later on, but uh, it's a little game for you to guess where the parents and dots are exactly. You can also use closures as parameters. You, uh, there's just one case where you need parents. It's when in the chain there's a method uh, which, has no, uh, which takes no argument, which has zero arguments, then you have to use the parents because otherwise we cannot guess. Uh, what the, the call is. Is it unique, which takes from as argument or not? And especially considering the last case, the case where you have three elements and not just method, args, method, args, method, args. Uh, so take three cookies is also allowed for an odd number of terms in your sentences. Now I'm going to put back the parents. So here, sugar and milk are actually two arguments for the with call. Uh, this one is interesting because uh, you have the impression that check that is the call somehow, but actually the named parameter is what is passed to check. So you have a, a way to reuse or abuse a, um, a, col um, a colon there uh, to look like the call is check that and that the, the, the sentence uh, must be checked afterwards. For the case with uh, closures, you just have to put the parents uh, around the closure. That's really just like each find all calls, etc. This one is pretty obvious as well. And take three dot cookies. It's a property access or a, a key uh, access in a map, etc. A very powerful stuff, uh, new, new feature for uh, domain specific languages. We worked on runtime performance improvement in the area of uh, primitive type of operations. So for our micro benchmarks, uh, we often use the uh, Fibonacci example, which historically been the kind of code which is the worst uh, in terms of performance for Groovy. Um, so this is one of the area where we could be as much as 13 times slower than Java because of the recursive nature and uh, the, all the uh, primitive op operations where we were doing boxing, unboxing, etc., rather than doing um, the uh, JVM instructions for adding primitive types. So we worked on that. So currently, if you write uh, a Fibonacci example, it, just, it, sh it should be just uh, perhaps 50% slower than Java, but not more. So 50%. And we are going to find ways to reduce that in a way uh, is much better than 13, 13 times slower. We bundle jeepers in the Groovy distribution. So uh, when you need um, to parallelize things, do things concurrently, etc., jeepers comes with a wide range of uh, options: uh, actors, fork join, map reduce, data flow, etc. Um, and also improving the APIs for things like um, uh, Java Util concurrent uh, executors, par parallel arrays, etc. 
So the, this is now bundled as part of uh, Groovy, so don't hesitate to use jippers. Then we worked on some new closure enhancements. Uh, let's have a look at closure annotation parameters. Um, when you have annotations in Java, you can have uh, your annotations can take parameters, but it's just um, primitives, strings, enum values, other annotations, strings, and uh, arrays of these things. But you cannot pass other kind of values or instances or anything uh, as parameters. But now, uh, we, well, we managed to find a way to encode a closure in the form of a class. So if you define um, uh, an annotation uh, with a value, which is actually a class, we're going to be able to encode the class of the closure uh, in, in, in that value here, which now allows you to call things like at invariant, and you pass a closure as parameter. <clears throat> and here, in our little example, it's a kind of uh, poor man implementation of design by contract. So you could define invariants, preconditions, postconditions, etc. Or it could be useful for framework authors as well, uh, who want to annotate some methods with you know, some conditions, etc. So this is a, a little example. Um, I advise you to look at the G-Contracts project, so you can Google G-Contracts. And it's a, a proper implementation of design by contract for Groovy, supporting pre post conditions, inheritance, and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to um, add that uh, to your project, you can use G-Contracts. Closure composition. Um, when you've got two closures, you want to compose together. Now we have some uh, special way to do that, thanks to also some operator of loading tricks. So you can compose two closures to have a resulting closures that apply uh, those two closures um, serially. So you have uh, composition and reverse composition uh, if you use right shift and uh, left shift. We have a closure trump line, uh, so with a little animation. Uh, for example, if you're ready uh, to change your recursive algorithms a little bit, Clo um, closure trampoline allows you to somehow stack up the list of calls and call that serially at the end of uh, the execution uh, to avoid things like stack overflow errors. I mean, if you do factorial, I think, uh, well, 100 or I, I don't remember the, the threshold, but beyond factorial 40 or something like that, in Java and in Groovy, or at least in Groovy, you'd get a stack overflow error. Uh, with this approach, if you rewrite your closure algorithms uh, to use the tramp line call, you are able to call things like factorial 1000 and, and beyond, because it's going to call and doing the calculation serially rather than um, recursively through an Mm, recursive method calls, which blow uh, the stack frame. We have closure memoization, so it's a way of remembering the outcome of invocations of uh, closures. So when you do a very complex operation, A plus B, with a <laughs> slip one, one second, um, uh, A plus P uh, obviously is faster and groovy than uh, one second, but uh, so the first time you call plus one and two, uh, it's going to return three. But since we put a, a sleep statement there, it's going to return three after one second. Okay. Since I memoized the closure, uh, the next time I'm going to call, uh, the memoization process remembers the value returned by the previous call for the same set of parameter values. So the next time I call plus one, two, it's going to return immediately. Right, um, and obviously your closure should be side effect free and return the same value for the same set of input arguments. Otherwise, don't use memoization because you might be surprised by uh, the outcome. Yeah, it's going to be faster, it's going to be faster. Cool, I'm going to memoize and then, uh, oops, it's not the result I was expecting. Anyway, so if you do another call, plus two and two, 
uh, it's a new call that's not been memoized, so it's going to take one second, but then a second call with the same set of values um, is going to return immediately. And you have some control over that. Um, so it's using an, a list recently used uh, cache strategy, but it's going to fill up the memory potentially. So you can also say, okay, I want to memoize at least a certain number of calls uh, and results, at most 10 invocations, or you can also specify, okay, I want to remember just between 10 and 20 uh, results. For example, for uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Fibonacci example, if you just remember the last, uh, at least the latest two calls, you won't have to recalculate the previous values, for example. <coughs> so, uh, by using memoization, you save some computation time for that kind of algorithm. But yes, please remember uh, to have side effect free uh, closures in that case, because otherwise you might have some surprises. Currying, currying improvement. Who's ever used um, the curry method in Groovy? Yeah, no, not many usually. Usually, like 10% of the audience who. Uh, who used curry. So it's a way of, um, uh, well, let, let, let's have a look at an, at an example. Uh, so it's not curry uh, the spice, but curry the mathematician. That's uh, where the name is coming from. Um, before you could curry from the left, so when you have a closure taking several arguments, uh, it's a way of fixing what, uh, a value for the first argument on the left. And here we have some variants to fix the values of uh, which are on the right uh, of the argument list. So, for, uh, y y when you carry a closure, you're, you get a, a new closure with one of the arguments which is fixed. So, for example, here I've got a divide closure, which is going to divide A by B. And here I'm going to fix the value of B uh, by calling R carry. This is going to return a closure here called however. Which, which is going to fix the value of B. And then you can call the new closure with the value of A only. You don't have to supply uh, the value, um, the, yeah, the value of A, you don't have to supply the value of B. We also have uh, an n curry method, which allows you to specify, um, well, the index of the parameter you want to curry. For example, imagine you have a closure which adds three elements together, which joins three elements together. Then I'm going to carry that closure to fix the, the separator. So this is index one, and the value I'm going to fix and set in stone. Then I can call that new closure with just the, the first parameter, A, and the second parameter, uh, the third, well, the last parameter, B, so that I have a, a new closure that joins with a special separator. In Guru 1.8, uh, we now have built in JSON support, so you can consume and produce JSON payloads uh, the same way, uh, more or less, uh, that you do uh, with XML. Groovy is pretty well known for its XML support. And uh, we thought that in this uh, era and age of uh, JSON, REST APIs, etc., it was time that we had proper JSON support built in uh, Groovy. Although, um, you know, frameworks like Grails obviously already had JSON support and there were libraries like JSON Lib from Andres over there, uh, but no built in support inside Groovy. So we fixed that. So uh, let's have a look at an example. So I, I've shortened the URL because it's a, a bit too long to fit in, a, in one slide. And I, I will show you a trick perhaps uh, you didn't remember about. You can create a URL pointing to the, the GitHub um, REST uh, API, for example, to retrieve the list of commits from the Groovy project or the Grails project. Then you can call dot .text on that URL to get the content of that remote URL. That's a nice little trick if you didn't know it. Then, just like XML slurper or parser, you, instanti you instantiate the slurper. You call parse text, same method name as uh, the XML support. You pass the, the text, the JSON representation, and it's parsed inside a document. And then, just like with XML, you can 
um, navigate the JSON object graph so that you can get all the commits objects in that, that JSON document, get the message of those commits, and for each of these messages, I'm going to print uh, the, the value associated with that message. So you're, it's, you, you don't have to do any you know, marshalling and marshalling, etc. You just call, you just have uh, the usual gpath expressions to navigate a JSON uh, object graph. And we also have uh, a builder for creating JSON payloads. So uh, here, I'm go well, I'm going to show you what it looks like. Uh, this uh, call, JSON person, name, Guillaume, etc. So I, I'm actually 34 now. I should fix that, and I have no pets, but that's for the sake of this example. Uh, it's going to create that kind of JSON, right? Well, actually, it's going to create uh, JSON without any um, formatting, but then you can also use a little utility method on the JSON output class to pretty print a JSON payload. So the previous example creates that kind of JSON uh, content. Well, we have um, many new AST transformations, so I'll go quickly through, through them. There are a bunch of them. First of all, we have an at log transform, which provides uh, some injection of uh, a logger in your classes. So there are different implementations using different loggers. Uh, at log is going to use the, the Java uh, util logging uh, framework. You have commands logging, log4j and slf4j support. So when you annotate a class with at log, it's going to create a new um, logger instance in your class transparently, so you don't have to do it yourself. And then you can call log info, log debug, etc., uh, depending on the API that you are using. Log info, and it's going to log that um, well on the output or elsewhere, depending on how you configured your your loggers. And it's, is there something that? Missing in that example, something you would do when you use loggers, usually. Little question, to see if you're awake or if the fact I'm speaking English makes you sleepy or something. So is there something missing there? Well, apart from the definition of the logger itself, is there something you would do when you do log info? I'm sure a few of you know, but usually you wrap your log info, log debug, call with um, lo uh, if log is uh, debug enabled or something like that, right? You, so usually you do that before um, co calling the uh, logging for log debug call. And actually the AST transformation injects that call for you. So we wrap the log info call that you put in your code with an if statement uh, checking that the, the level of logging is uh, is correct or allowed to be uh, logged. So transparently doing that work for you, uh, injecting a new logger in your class and wrapping all your calls with an if statement. Okay? When you use scripts uh, and you define, well, for example, let's have a look at this example, but with that, the add field call, uh, sometimes users are surprised because when you do, um, you define a list uh, called O here, um, and then you want to use it from within a method, uh, Groove is going to complain because the, the definition of that list is actually part of um, the implementation of a run method inside, inside your script instance. So the variable is not available uh, for all the methods. So those methods don't see that variable. Uh, with the add field transform, um, the, this variable is not a local variable of the run method, but instead it's becoming a field of the script class that is created for your script. So if you annotate with add field, you'll be able to access that variables from other methods. Sometimes people are using Groovy for extending their, their, their application. Uh, for example, I have one of my customers 
a big customer uh, who's using Groovy um, for well for customizing. Um, well, let me tell you a bit more about that example. Um, so it's a it's a company who's providing uh, services for airlines, uh, travel agencies, etc., to book flights, hotels, trains, etc. And they have a platform uh, that their customers can use and customize uh, so as to get uh, the, the kind of um, interface that they really want. So for example, I'm usually flying on Air France and the services uh, which are used in the booking part of the website is actually using uh, my, the, this uh, stuff from my customer. And they are uh, working currently on a new feature which allows their customers, travel agencies, airlines, etc., to customize their platform uh, for their needs, uh, providing different um, uh, templates for uh, selecting a flight, etc. And they are doing that with Groovy. And the thing is, they run, my customer runs that platform and let code coming from their customers run on their platform. So what happens if a customer makes a mistake or voluntarily uh, want to harm um, that company? And, uh, and in the, if the user's code is going to have infinite loops or uh, takes too much time to run or consumes too many resources, too much of a particular resource, then how can you control the execution of that user code, Groovy code, so that you can stop it if it's doing something wrong? With Groovy 1.8, we have three new transforms uh, that helps you uh, solve those problems, those kind of problems. So we have thread interrupt, <coughs> Let's imagine that I'm going to run this user script in my own platform. Uh, while true, it's going to eat a lot of CPU and will run forever. So how can I stop that kind of code? Uh, you cannot properly interrupt a thread uh, in Java for various reasons. But what this uh, transform is doing, so here uh, you see that we have to explicitly, explicitly use add thread interrupt, etc. But you can, there are ways to hide that from uh, the code. But I'll tell you a bit more about that later. So how can I stop the execution of that stuff? Um, with thread interrupt, we are going to check that the thread was called to be interrupted from within, from within another thread. And how do we do that? At every beginning of a code block, or at the very beginning of a closure block, uh, we add transparently statements like this one. If thread, get current thread, is interrupted, then we throw some exception. So even if you wanted to loop forever, uh, if someone externally said, okay, interrupt that user's running thread, uh, the next time you'll do the loop, you're going to get an exception thrown at that point to stop the ex execution of that long-running while loop. There are some additional parameters that you can specify on the annotation. You can also specify a duration. I want to stop the execution of that code. So I'm okay if you're doing while true loops, but at least your script should finish at, at a point or, or another. So we have timed interrupt, and you can specify an amount of time as well as a unit. Uh, to say, okay, I'm okay if you run for 10 seconds, but after 10 seconds, I'm going to shut you down. And I'm going to throw some uh, interrupted uh, exception again. We also have a conditional interrupt so that you can specify, and here see how we are using the uh, closure annotation parameter uh, technique that we learned about earlier. So you can monitor uh, some conditions. Uh, if you're using too, many, too much memory or too many resources or you, you have too many file descriptors open or whatever condition, you can define your own condition within the closure. Uh, you can stop the execution once uh, that condition is met. So for example, here, uh, the guy is trying to loop 100 times and print a message 100 times, but I have some counter which says, okay, don't loop more than twice. 
So this is a, a dummy example, but um, imagine that you have a more useful condition in your uh, closure annotation parameter. We have other um, useful transforms like add to string, which provides uh, a default to string implementation instead of uh, you know person at uh, one two three four five. So you have uh, this default um, to string implemented now. If you use add to string instead of writing your own string to string representation inside a to string method. We have equals and hash code, uh, which, well, as the name implies, implements uh, the equals on the hash code method. So here I create two instances. I check that they are equals and that their hash code are uh, equals. We also have, so especially when you're interacting uh, with Java, with Java you are used to using constructors which take uh, all the parameters, oh, all the, well, as parameters, all the, all the fields which are available in your class. Um, so here with add tuple constructor, I'm going to add a new constructor. The transformation is going to do that job for you. Uh, it's going to add a new uh, person constructor taking name and age. And this is uh, the proof that we uh, created that constructor because I can create uh, this new person using that new constructor. So Marion is my daughter, and she's uh, three and a half now. And you can use uh, all these annotation, two string equals an hash code and tuple constructor, with uh, the at canonical transform. It's uh, mixing <coughs> those three together. So it's um, somehow like the at immutable transformation, but for mutable classes. Because at immutable is doing the same work uh, as uh, at canonical, but for immutable structures. Uh, so canonical uh, does uh, all those three transforms, and you can also customize to string or equals an hash code, etc., uh, by using at canonical plus to string, uh, if you use the two annotations together. So this is a way of combining those three together. Um, what else about canonical? No, I think that's all. Yes, um, as we were speaking about tuple constructors, um, when you want to create your own exception, you have to uh, extend exception, the exception class. And the problem is that you also have to override all the constructors. Even if the implementation of those constructors is stupid because you just have to call super, but you still have to do that. So in Java, you would have to have the four constructors defined. And if those constructors aren't doing anything useful beyond just calling super, you can use the at inherit constructors. Uh, in the title misses an S. Uh, you use at inherit constructors and you can remove those four uh, constructors and they will be implemented for you by the compiler. Um, we also have with read write lock with write lock, which is using um, the Java util. Uh, uh, what's a concurrent? Uh, what's the name? Uh, read write uh, reentrant read write lock. I never remember the the name of the class or the package. Uh, so instead of you using things like synchronized methods and so on, you can use a proper reentrant read write lock, so that certain methods are guarded. Um, with a read lock, because you can have concurrent reads, but you can only have one uh, write at a time. So you can use those two annotations to have a more granular way of using, uh, and transparent way of using a lock. Because normally you have to say, okay, uh, lock dot, uh, lock, no, or acquire, or I don't remember the, the method name. Then in a try, finally block, you're going to do something. Then in the finally block, you must uh, release the lock. And instead of writing that kind of code yourself and wrap your business code with that kind of try finally calls, the transform is doing that job for you. So Groovy has always been with that you know, mentality that we want to simplify your work, your job, uh, so that uh, you have less to type, you have less to think about, because Groovy is going to do the work for you. That's 
always the kind of things we had in mind to simplify the life of developers. Um, and some other uh, new features, so remember um, the at time, the interrupt, thread interrupt, etc. Uh, users code would have had to have the at time, the interrupt uh, annotation specified in their users code. Uh, but they, I mean, if uh, they don't comply with that, um, they could have made, you know, a while true loop which, run, which runs forever and uh, not using the thread interrupt or timed interrupt annotation and then it, would, it wouldn't stop. So we have to find ways so that we can inject such transforms uh, transparently so that the user doesn't have to you know, do that job. So for example, so we have uh, three compilation customizers, an import customizer to add new imports, default imports in your scripts and classes. We have a secure AST customizer to secure uh, the execution of uh, your Groovy scripts and also an AST transformation customizer which injects uh, AST transforms and especially local transformations with an, an, an annotation so that it's transparent for the one who is authoring the Groovy script or class. And you can also implement your own uh, customizers. Let's have a look at the first one. Let's say you have a, a ma or a financial or a math uh, application uh, that is trying to evaluate a math expression like cosine pi divided by three. Um, you would have to, uh, in, in your script with that formula, you would have had to uh, import uh, Java lang math and also import static Java lang math dot all the constants like pi. Um, so just for a formula like cos pi uh, divided by 3, you would have had to have at least two imports to import the cos method and the pi constant. So here, uh, if I'm evaluating expressions using the groovy shell object, I can specify a customizer on the compilation configuration object. So then I pass that configuration to my groovy shell so that each time I'm going to evaluate some expression here, I'm going to add those imports and static imports and star imports, etc. Uh, somehow, um, before the execution of the, of, the, of the script, if you will. So those imports are becoming transparent and added by default. Uh, with the AST transformation customizer, you can inject loggers uh, inject uh, transforms, uh, including local transformations. That's where it's especially useful. So, for example, if you remember my earlier example with the at log transform, which injects a logger in your classes, uh, I can automatically, again, uh, inject <coughs> a local transformation. Here, I'm injecting at log so that the at log uh, annotation is not needed on the, on the class. Uh, so here, atlog is going to be uh, applied to the car class, but also to the script class. So you have two loggers, one for the car and one for your script. So I can inject an AST transform. Um, well, I'll go very quickly through that one, but the AST customizer is a way to say, um, I allow you to use this and that aspect of the Groovy language. For example, I can say I'm going to evaluate uh, users' uh, expressions, but for example, I can say, okay, in your script, you are not allowed to use, to define closures. You're not allowed to define methods. You're not allowed, so you can define a whitelist or blacklist of imports and classes that you are allowed to use. Or you are also able to say uh, some of the tokens of the Groovy grammar, the tokens you want to be able to use or forbid uh, usage. For example, if you're not allowed to use plus in your script for some reason, you can prevent that. So you can really restrict portions of the Groovy language that are allowed to be used in your script to have even more control on what users are doing. So I, I'll spare you the details there, um, but you can um, use that compilation configuration uh, method to add that customizer so that uh, well in, in the example across the three slides, so I'm still doing the same uh, 
uh, arithmetic uh, expression evaluation, but I'm allowing uh, all the Java lang math calls and constants, etc. But if you want to, to use another method call, like system exit zero, uh, people won't be able to call system exit zero uh, because I've disallowed method calls on anything else. And exit is a method call, a static method call on system. A new little addition, you can coerce strings and g-strings to enum values. So in your code you could very well use uh, the red constant or blue constant to create an enum value. Um, yeah, in Groovy 183, <laughs> you can customize, so for those who are using the, the Groovy shell, uh, you can customize the prompt, so instead of seeing uh, Groovy 0, 0, 0, you can uh, customize the prompt. So on Mac OS X, it's working with uh, Unicode characters, so I love Groovy <laughs> kind of prompt. Uh, a nice new little feature is um, you can uh, execute remote scripts hosted somewhere on, on the web. Uh, so be careful uh, what you're going to use because uh, if you don't know or if someone hacks the remote script, uh, you have, um, you know, doing uh, execute uh, rm slash uh, dash rf or something like that. Be careful to what you're executing. But if you trust and if you know what's uh, available in the remote URL, you can use Groovy and a URL to execute that script. And now the last part, what's cooking for Groovy 1.9? And just so, although we haven't yet uh, formally announced that, with the new features which are coming in 1.9, we'll most probably rename 1.9 to 2.0. So that's a scoop for you guys. Let's call it 1.9 for now. So we have um, certain things which are already implemented and available in 1.9 uh, betas, which are already released and some which are a work in progress. So I'll show you those ones that are already implemented and those ones that are coming. And the roadmap is not uh, really set in stone already. So if you, are, if you have some ideas of things that you'd like to see in GUI 1.9 and beyond, please um, be sure to provide the feedback that, okay, I'd like to have this feature, etc. Because Groovy is what it is today, thanks to you guys. Because that, thanks to your feedback, that you know we have this and that feature, we implement that. But ultimately, that's the kind of things you've came up, you know, with. Uh, okay, could you do this with Groovy, etc.? So, well, usually it's uh, you know the audience who thanks the speaker for the talk. But here, I'm thanking you guys for uh, making Groovy what it is today. Thanks to your contributions, bug reports, help on the user list, etc., and patches and etc and feature requests. So, thanks a lot. So, don't hesitate to provide your feedback. So, let's have a look at uh, what's cooking. Uh, we aligned Groovy with the project coin improvements uh, in Java 7. So, for example, you can use binary representation for numbers uh, with the B, 0, B uh, notation. So, 0, 1, 0, 1, uh, to create uh, your own binary literals. You can also use underscores uh, to separate, um, you know, like uh, thousands or, uh, for example, for credit card numbers, if you want to group by four digits or hexadecimal values. We also implemented the multi-catch. So instead of having two catch clauses for uh, try-catch, one for IO exception and one for null pointer exception, you can use this uh, pipe uh, character uh, to say, okay, for those two exceptions, I'm going to do the exact same uh, routine. And we've just started working on invoke dynamic support, which is about new, um, new instructions to speed up uh, dynamic method calls and other aspects. So it's a brand new branch, and currently um, there's not much yet available. So that's why I, I put the little uh, working progress icon over there. So the idea is to have more runtime performance, as usual, um, because it's, it's somehow an obsession to make Groovy faster. Um, and in the long run, it will be interesting because we'll be able to get rid of some of the op optimizations that we hand-coded uh, to improve the performance of Groovy. 
Um, well, I'll spare you the details once again because uh, it's pretty complex, but uh, what's coming in Invoke Dynamic is going to be pretty useful to Groovy to speed up the execution of your dynamic code. We are also working on making Groovy more modular. Uh, so the, the Groovy jar is already above 4 megabytes, and um, the thing is that not Everybody needs everything from Groovy, so if you don't care about end scripting, swing UI, sorry, Andres, <laughs> or uh, template engines, etc., uh, perhaps you just need the core of the language plus template engine, but you don't need anything else. So we'll try to make uh, a smaller core jar and additional little jars, plus providing various hooks to set up uh, new dynamic methods like the default Groovy methods, like from, from the Groovy JDK. So it's a work in progress, and um, we should be there in Groovy 19. And I'll finish with that new feature, which is static type checking. Um, and again, um, n not everybody uh, needs dynamic features, and there are many users using Groovy for scripting Java APIs, and who don't need the dynamicity of Groovy itself. So we have a new mode, with, which is uh, implemented uh, somehow with a, an, a, a triggered by an annotation like local transformations. Uh, Grumpy, uh, like the dwarf Grumpy, uh, that's why you have a, a dwarf, uh, it should make the compiler Grumpy, right? So it should complain if you make a typo in the name of a method or a variable. Uh, it should complain if you uh, assign a value to some variable which is of the wrong type, etc. It should complain. But still, it should, do, it should be clever enough uh, to have some type inference so that uh, you don't have to use casts and that kind of things. And it should also understand uh, the groovy um, JD, uh, GDK methods. Let's have a look at some examples. If you annotate uh, a method with add type checked, for example, method with that spelling doesn't exist, or if you access a variable name, but you see that there's a typo there, now the compiler will complain. And I, I really say the compiler will complain. So it won't be a runtime error, it'll be a compilation error. So before you even run that code, it's going to complain at compile time. Uh, here are some examples of uh, wrong assignments. So you cannot assign some roundup object to an a primitive to a set, etc. So it's going, going to complain uh, there. Or for example, uh, if you've got a, a, an array of string, if you want to uh, put the string inside an int, obviously it's going to fail, etc. So the compiler will be more grumpy. Um, it will complain also on wrong return types. So again, uh, well, the, the first one is more about assignment than return types, but for example, if the implement, in the implement, implementation of your method, which is supposed to be written in an int, you say, okay, I can return a string, the compiler is going to complain. And, uh, yeah, greeting, uh, what's the last example? But still, um, for, for example, when you uh, have a method which returns, so, uh, here I'm using a string builder, and this call is going to happen uh, stuff in the string builder, and the, this expression returns the string builder, Groovy automatically does the two string for you. So that's plain dynamic Groovy uh, at play here. And Grumpy won't complain for the things which are usually Groovy, basically. So it tries to be Grumpy, but still allows uh, the, the usual Grumpy, uh, the, the usual <laughs> Groovy, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the usual Groovy aspects. Compilation errors there. And also for a uh, thing, so we, it's clever uh, enough to be doing uh, type inference. So for example, you can use two uppercase, which is a string method on the variable there. Although I didn't define the variable as a string, uh, it knows that name is currently a string. And uh, the, the trim method, which is part of the GDK methods, not part of the Java length string method, is also okay. And, 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 and uh, yeah, and things like uh, figuring out what are the, the values in the map. Uh, well, this is also the kind of things that Grumpy is happy about. 
And currently, you cannot mix statically checked methods and uh, or statically checked code and dynamic code. So if you want to do, for example, using a builder, you can refactor the usage of the builder <coughs> in a non-type checked method. So this is going to be dynamic. And here, this is going to be checked. I'm going to, to call that method and but be clever enough. Uh, I know, okay, this is a string and this is going to return a string because that's the contract, etc. So you can still have um, uh, a mix of dynamic and statically che checked codes. And um, although it's not yet formally announced, we are also uh, looking at supporting static compilation. So not just static type checking, but also compilation. Well, some uh, well, additional little things, um, like uh, we have a new bytecode viewer inside the uh, Groovy console. We, can, we have also more control on AST transformations so that it can disable global AST transformations, etc. So a very short summary. Groovy rocks and is still going to rock in uh, upcoming versions. So thanks a lot for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions afterwards because we are running out of time. Thanks a lot. We, we do have time for a couple of questions, so if there sí, is some questions. questions. Yep. Hay alguna pregunta? Si la queréis hacer en español, puedo intentar traducir. ¿Vale? ¿Alguien quiere preguntar? question over there. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the Groovy++ project. Yes. Uh, uh, it seems that you are implementing some features that are already in the Groovy++. Mm -hmm. uh, do you actually uh, include some code from Groovy++? Will the Groovy++ project uh, disappear or will, uh, will they coexist? Yeah, so uh, the thing is uh, Groovy++ does certain things differently from what we thought was the groovy way of doing things. So there are differences between what we are doing here and what Groovy++ is doing. Groovy++ made some uh, specific decisions uh, without necessarily you know, involving the community, etc. So here we're trying to involve the community on each aspect of uh, static type checking and later on uh, most probably static compilation. Uh, to be sure that it's as groovy as it can be uh, so that there are less semantic differences between groovy and statically checked and compiled groovy. So this is uh, obviously a new re-implementation and for, uh, well, for various other reasons we couldn't really integrate the Groovy++ code unfortunately. Uh, so we went with the other approach with somehow reinventing the wheel in some areas but also involving the community uh, in areas where uh, we think some debate needs to be done and some decisions need, need to be made and um, in order to make the code much more groovy friendly so that groovy users are not um, surprised by the fact that groovy++ code behaves differently from normal groovy code. So we are trying to find a, um, a better way uh, than what's been implemented in groovy++. So now the, the fate of groovy++ is beyond me because I'm not working on Groovy++ per se, so we'll see what uh, uh, people do and the uh, developers of the Groovy++ project do. Another ¿Alguna question? pregunta más? Nadie quiere preguntar nada. Bueno, pues entonces vamos a darle las gracias una vez más a Guillaume.